Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, or the study of the Book of Acts. Uh, we will get started with a word of prayer. Uh, I'll request Jefina to please lead us. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this class that we are about to have, where I just bless everyone in my class. We bless Pastor Nancy and all my dear classmates and friends. Lord, I pray that you will give us good life by commission throughout this session so that we can look into the life of Paul and the Act and the Book of Acts a little more deeper and we can learn from you, Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we are listening. Help us to open our mind and heart and listen to each and every single truth in the Bible, Jesus. May your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeffina. So in the last class, we uh, had a brief introduction of the book of Acts, and we understood that Luke is the writer of this book, and we saw how there is a progression as far as the growth of the church is concerned, the evolving of the church structure is concerned, um, and the, the uh, great commission of the Lord Jesus for all his disciples, we find that the believers of the book of Acts are actually living that great commission and mighty signs and wonders are being accomplished through their lives. We uh, also saw that um, it spread over a region, the various events of uh, this, this book uh, in Asia Minor. And uh, uh, though we may say that uh, the, the apostles could not really go to the ends of the earth, we know that it was a beginning uh, for this fulfilling of the great commission that God called them to do. Uh, and we saw how uh, in Acts chapter 1, the Lord resurrected Jesus, is instructing the disciples, he's spending time with the disciples, and then he ascends up into heaven in a very clear manner. Following that, he instructs them to tarry or wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is a prerequisite for them to move in signs, wonders, and miracles. And we will see so much more uh, about how they begin to manifest the power of God through their lives later on. Um, but now this is the instruction that Jesus gave them in Acts 1.8. He said that you shall receive power from on high. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So uh, in Acts 1, they are waiting. They are waiting as a community. We saw how uh, about 120 people are waiting in the upper room. And uh, during that time, Peter feels that it is important to um, ensure that there are 12 apostles. So he calls for an election. And uh, we also noted how these people were dependent on God in everything. Now, this was basically a you might say a leadership decision, isn't it, for uh, Peter as well as the uh, the people over there to select the 12th person. Because Judas was uh, earlier with them, but he betrayed Jesus. And so there was a position vacant for another apostle. Uh, we saw how these disciples, as well as the uh, women who had gathered and others who were with them, they were prayerful. They prayed before they made this decision. Uh, yes, they cast the lots, but uh, they depended on God for the answer that came from him. And finally, Matthias was the one who was chosen as the 12th apostle. And uh, this is where we stopped in our last class. So today, we will continue in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, what's happening is that we have, uh, you know, all, uh, all these 120 people, okay, they are uh, waiting for the promise of the Father or the promise that the Lord Jesus made about the coming of the Holy Spirit. So this is where we are at. Uh, and uh, let me just see if I can... Uh, uh, okay, let's go forward with this. Maybe I'll show you uh, a map a little later on. All right. So uh, can somebody um, go ahead and read for us, please? Uh, if you may read for us. Uh, it is a little long passage here, but one person could read from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. 
I, I will uh, explain it and then the next section can be read by another person. Please go ahead. Okay, so uh, throughout this course, you know, you may need to uh, to read some passages uh, so that we have better clarity, and also ask questions, uh, answer to some of the the you know questions that I may be asking. So please be prepared to to speak uh, speak out loud. Um, <clears throat> all right, could somebody read, please? Acts chapter two, verse one to verse thirteen. There came a sound from heaven as of a, of a thrashing mind, mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, I mean other tongues, as the spirit gave them utterance, the crowd is response. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under earth, under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another, look, are they not all these who speak Galileans? Or how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Almites, the, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Potos and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, uh, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining great visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabs. We are here. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful work of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another. What, whatever could this mean? Others mocking, saying, said they are full of new wine. Amen. Thank you, uh, Lubega. Thank you for reading that passage. So here we are understanding that uh, the day of Pentecost had fully come. What is the meaning of that? I told us that when Jesus was tried and he died on the cross, it happened during the Passover. And there was a certain day marked for uh, Pentecost. While preparations for Pentecost were happening, 50 days from uh, the Passover would be the Pentecost. So that, that 50 day timeline is completed and Pentecost is actually here. Uh, that is what you know, we, we recognize over here. So we are being told that the day of Pentecost had fully come. All right. Now, Jesus had stayed with them something like 40 days. So how long uh, would they have needed to wait after the Lord Jesus ascended? So, somewhere uh, about 10 days is what we we look at and we say, okay, they must have been praying and waiting for the Lord for 10 days. And Jesus promised them in the earlier passage, we saw that not, uh, you know, very far from now or quite soon in some days, something is going to happen. Something powerful is going to happen. So they knew that they were waiting, but in a matter of days, something was going to happen. Now, uh, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, what's happening? These people are continuing in 
one accord and um, you know with with a prayerful attitude one accord is oneness of heart oneness of mind uh, it's not so much just people being together now we all understand that we could be together physically but our hearts may be far apart uh, but in this case the beauty of the early uh, believers is that when they gathered in prayer you find the mention of this term one accord which is very powerful so they were gathered in one accord which means oneness of heart oneness of mind oneness of purpose uh, in and in one place okay so physically also they were present together what is it that they were looking forward to obviously they were looking forward to the outpouring of the holy spirit upon them now notice verse 2 says and suddenly was it really a suddenly in a in um uh, the context we know that they were waiting for the outpouring of the holy spirit so it's not like they didn't know that this is going to happen they knew something is going to happen uh, but they just didn't know when so even when we wait on the promises of god we know yes god is going to come through for us and we will see the manifestation of the word uh, we will see the manifestation of standing in faith uh, and what god really does is while we wait for him in this way there are these suddenlies okay the suddenlies uh, come upon us and scripture say and suddenly there came a sound from heaven so and suddenly there came a sound from heaven when luke is reporting so luke uh, we understood a little bit about his background that he's quite a systematic historian and also a physician so uh, he would not be writing fictitious accounts for us so when he says there came a sound from heaven that is a tangible experience that people had people talked about and you know even luke is testifying to this so there must have been a real sound which uh, uh, came from heaven and what else there are other expressions of as of a rushing mighty wind okay so how is this sound it's like a, a rushing mighty wind in other terms it is very powerful we all know uh, when there's a, a gentle breeze uh, it's very pleasant and comforting to our hearts but when we hear a um, uh, you know a, a mighty wind uh, of let's say a storm that is is brewing up stirring up or you know uh, if we have watched a tornado and we have seen the sound of that powerful wind that you know goes ahead that moves um, uh, very forcefully uh, something like that we can imagine so there is a sound a powerful sound what kind of a sound of a rushing mighty wind now mighty wind as jews uh, you know people would associate in those times with um, uh, you know the the wind uh, having to do with god and uh, you know because god created with his breath so somewhere that concept of breath air wind uh, associated with the with the work of god or the spirit of god uh, would have been there in their minds so even at this point when they are experiencing this great sound of a rushing mighty wind uh, and we are told that uh, it filled the whole house where they were sitting so they must have had this sense of awe uh, that yes god has come to visit us whatever jesus talked about is beginning to manifest in our midst and see how the account is so dramatic the first time that the holy spirit uh, came upon the believers was uh, very powerful and um, uh, we don't necessarily see something similar happen every time we are now you know sort of refilled with the holy spirit uh, in our walk with the lord but on the day of pentecost the very first instance where the holy spirit was poured out this was their experience what happened they were all in prayer they were all in one accord because they were seeking the promise of god jesus said that you know uh, that he would uh 
power from on high would be bestowed on them. So that was their purpose. We need to receive this power from on high because he had instructed them, saying, you need it. And uh, you know, don't go anywhere. First, you receive this power. And with that intention, they were waiting upon the Lord. And then there was this uh, tangible experience where they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And what else happened? It filled the whole house where they were sitting. So it was not just the experience of one person, but it was the experience of uh, ev everyone there who, who felt this and heard the sound coming upon them. Then what else is going on? Uh, and we are also told that there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Now, divided tongues of fire or flames of fire sitting upon each one of them could also be a tangible experience in the sense that you know they could have they could have um, seen it with their natural eye or even their spirit senses could have been activated and they could have uh, seen what exactly is going on around them and like tongues of fire or flames of fire were, were sitting upon these 120 people for the believers, uh, they would have known that this has got to do something with the Holy Spirit because the presence of God, you know how in the Old Testament, uh, they we can see the way God manifested, you know, the way he manifested uh, the, the presence of God, even manifested in, in the form of um, uh, like fire, the burning bush, right? What was that? That was the presence of God. So somewhere they kind of had that idea. Uh, and even when the Israelites were moving, you know, the fire by night, the cloud by day. So the fire uh, that came upon them would have given them a sense that God is in our midst and God is doing something. And it came and it sat upon each one, it says. Now, that is also special for God. He could have just had a, a, a big fire in the middle of the the place where they were seated and the holy spirit could have been uh you know poured out upon each one but when god does something in the scriptures when we see that he's working in a certain way we can uh sense his heart so fire coming upon each one each one of the 120 people just shows us how god is um uh, you know how he loves to to bless every single believer with his power and with his glory so on that day as they waited upon the lord they encountered the glory of god so the place was filled with that sound and that sense of awe and verse 4 says and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here is the manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. How? In the form of a gift of a Spirit which is speaking in tongues. So when the Holy Spirit filled them, they started to manifest a gift of the Spirit. Later on, we read about this in First Corinthians chapter twelve. Uh, we also read about uh, you know tongues in First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Uh, but here, in this first instance, the manifestation of a gift of the Spirit is taking place. Uh, now, how are they speaking in tongues? The Bible tells us here the spirit gave them utterance meaning the sounds are not their own uh, in other words they are not learned um, sounds because we know that when we learn a language we are trained uh, to you know trained in phonetics we uh, we know how to formulate words and communicate those words but in this situation it's not like they are speaking a language which they know or which they have learned they are speaking a language as per the um, ability given by the holy spirit so the holy spirit is giving them the utterance is what we are being told all right so this language is not a familiar language to them. Now, moving on to verse 5, we see, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. So we have to um, see the context of when all this is happening. So the day of Pentecost was a time when Jews from all the surrounding places, uh, not just the uh, Judean region, but you know, far beyond the Judean region would come 
to Jerusalem because that was the central place where they would gather for their worship. And that is why in Acts chapter 2, we are told that dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That means the Jews from far, um, far away had gathered in Jerusalem when all this happened. And verse 6, and when the sound occurred, the multitude came together. So again, we can ask the question, was this uh, something that Luke imagined or something that was perceived uh, uh, in the spirit of the believers? Or was it a tangible manifestation? From what Luke is writing, seems like a tangible manifestation because he says, when this sound occurred, what sound? The sound of a rushing mighty wind occurred. Uh, people around heard it. That is why the multitude came together and were confused. Okay, now he's extending that. He's also talking about the fact that because they heard them speak in his own language. So there were two sounds which uh, others could have experienced. And uh, those sounds were one of a Russian mighty wind. Second is people speaking in this language as, um, as encouraged or as empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the utterances are all as given by the Holy Spirit. So you can imagine the scene with me. Here in the upper room, 120 people, suddenly there's a sound and then all of these people are filled with the spirit. They begin to speak in tongues. People around are hearing these noises and they are rushing to the upper room and they are watching what's going on. Uh, so I also want to encourage us, there is a, um, a, a movie called as uh, The Acts of the Apostles, which uh, has been recorded as per the verses in the book of acts so it'll go verse by verse whatever has been uh, narrated here they've tried to capture it in the same way so that's also something that you can uh, uh, watch just to get the idea of how these things could have looked uh, so imagine with me people are all have come uh, they are shocked by the sounds and they are observing these people who are speaking in uh, an, a different language but Luke says here, heard them speak in his own language. Okay. So for the believers, they are speaking based on the utterance given by the Spirit. For the um, unbelievers who have come to the spot, they are hearing their own language, is what Luke is saying. Okay, what, what else? Let's see. Uh, then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language and in which we were born? Okay, so these uh, onlookers are amazed at the fact that uh, their own language is being spoken. I told us there are people from... Uh, many regions here. So it's not just, you know, uh, one or two places that people have come from. Uh, and then, you know, they kind of uh, share the list of which places they have come from. Let me quickly uh, show you a map. Okay. Yeah. Can you all see? Yeah? All right, great. So this is what it looks like. So in Acts chapter 2, okay, verse of uh, 5 to 12, where we are seeing that uh, the believers are gathered in the upper room and people from all regions are there. Uh, you know, Luke goes on to explain where these people are from. So, you know, when we read that uh, passage, uh, he says uh, something like uh, from verse 9, uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and uh, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, 
Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So isn't that amazing that there are people from at least 15 different regions Okay, or at least you can, when you begin to count the names of these places, at least 15 different places, and uh, they might have had their own languages, their own dialects, and they are saying, it's amazing. How is it that we can hear these people speak in our language? Okay, so what uh, this tongues is, is uh, when we study about speaking in tongues, uh, in uh, our APC um, publications, you can go and uh, study regarding this gift of the Holy Spirit. There are books like The Wonderful Benefits of Speaking in Tongues. Uh, there's another book, Gifts of the Holy Spirit. There we, uh, we can see that you know, uh, tongues are also categorized. So this tongues, which is being spoken of in Acts chapter 2, is the tongues which is known as a sign to the unbeliever. So how does the sign to the unbeliever manifest? People, the believer speaks in tongues, but it is heard as a learnt language okay, uh, to the listener. So that's what is happening here in Acts chapter 2. When the believer is speaking in tongues, the listener, unbeliever, is hearing in tongues his or her own language. Now, another beauty of what is going on here is that they recognize the Jews um, uh, Jews and proselytes. Who are proselytes? Proselytes are non-Jews who now follow uh, the Jewish religion, the Jewish God, the Jewish traditions. So uh, that that is uh, these are the two categories, Jews and proselytes, okay? Uh, Non-Jews who follow Judaism are uh, proselytes. So, all these people have, are devout. That is the reason they have now gathered in Jerusalem. They also recognize that the speakers of the of these languages are but Galileans. Now, what is the significance of Galileans? It is said that Galileans uh, were not considered among the learned people. They were not considered among the scholarly people. They were not considered among you know people who can um, uh, speak fluently or clearly. Uh, and apparently, you know, I, I read that uh, uh, they had an accent from their own region. So they wouldn't be able to pronounce uh, other uh, words in other languages quite clearly. So these were all the, the challenges that Galileans had uh, in those times. And that is why they are especially pointing out and saying that aren't these people Galileans? How is it that they are speaking in our languages? And another uh, important uh, point that you know they are making is they are saying that what is it that they are hearing? Okay, something is spoke, being spoken in their language, but the meaning of what is being spoken. So they are saying that uh, they are speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Okay, so when we are speaking in tongues, we know that uh, it's it's about speaking in the will of God. So in this situation. Uh, what's happening when people are speaking in tongues what is actually being said is you know praises to god glory to god and the wonderful works of god are being spoken now let's focus uh, on the last verse over here or, or let's last two verses where we read so they were all amazed and perplexed saying to one another whatever could this mean Others mockingly, mocking said, they are full of new wine. Now, what is going on here is what goes on even today. Okay, there is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Um, and we uh, see that the Holy Spirit is filling the believers and they are uh, uh, moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, people who are watching this exercise, okay, what is their reaction? One reaction that we have already noticed is they are saying, hey, how is this uh, happening? We are so amazed. People are speaking the wonderful works of God. And how is how could this happen? So it's a very positive reaction where it's making them inquisitive. It's making them question. Uh, 
you know, wanting to know more about God. So it's a very positive kind of a question that is being asked. But at the same time, for the same experience that is going on, there is another reaction. Now, this reaction is a negative reaction okay, where people are saying and they are mocking, Luke says. They mocked and said they are full of new wine. Okay, so there are others who are looking at this phenomenon and uh, they uh, are not happy with it. And they are uh, definitely not attributing it to God. In fact, they are critical about it, critical about the, the people who are manifesting the, the uh, gifts of the spirit. And they're saying, hey, something is wrong. These guys look like they are drunk. OK, uh, so I don't think the reactions of people has changed, whether it was 2,000 years ago or even today. We get a similar set of reactions. We get one set of reactions where uh, people are willing to understand this. If this is God, then you know what else can I know about God? It draws them towards God. But then there could also be people who see the work of the Spirit in and through our lives, and uh, you know they might uh, say, "Oh, something is wrong with this person," or you know, uh, "This is definitely not God." So this has been going on, and uh, this is nothing new. And when we especially talk about revivals, and you know, we study about the many revivals in history, uh, time and again, this is what we will see. People were accepting of it, but then there was a whole uh, set of people who questioned uh, the very work of God. Not that you can't question. Yeah, we all question. It's a reasonable thing to do, uh, but not being able to accept and the Holy Spirit is moving in a different way. And notice, whatever manifestation happened on that day was unique. Things like this had never happened before. And isn't that true? Even in our experience of the presence of God and our times with the Lord, the way he ministers uh, can be so different you know, from the way we've experienced it in the past. So let me just uh, uh, pause for a moment. Uh, to just get some of your comments and your reactions. Um, uh, yes, yes, Jeffina, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I have a few questions. So uh, in the first verse, we read the day of Pentecost had fully come. Um, so why it was written like it fully came? Is there any any reason behind it? Uh, that's one of my first questions. Should yeah. I? Uh, and the other question that I have is in verse 5, we read, they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Uh, so we saw the map, like uh, how people came from where they came. So the people physically came from all those uh, areas, or they were actually in Jerusalem. All those people were in Jerusalem, and they just gathered. These are my questions. Yeah. Thank you, um, Jafina. So good questions. The first one where um, you asked the day of Pentecost fully came, uh, it was just a way of saying that it was finally the 50th day. Because there would have been uh, celebrations. The uh, you know Pentecost is, is the festival of the first fruits. So there would have been celebrations and rituals leading up to that final day. So that is why they are saying it had fully come. It simply means that uh, it was finally the 50th day and you know the a proper time of uh, uh, celebrating. OK, so I, I hope that uh, clarifies. And your uh, uh, second question, could you come again, please? Oh, uh, the people who had come from around, it says dwelling in Jerusalem. They were, they were already in Jerusalem. Yeah. Other places. So, what would happen at the time of Pentecost is that people would come and they would uh, live in Jerusalem, which means they would have rented out places and they would have. It, it's not like today, like you fly in the morning uh, to a city and then you fly out in the evening. They do not have the kind of transportation that we have. So, maybe because of that, they would uh, plan prior join the early festivities, stay on a little longer, and then go back. And that is why it says dwelling in Jerusalem. So they would stay a substantial amount of time. 
even later you know we are going to see this uh, uh, that later uh, when when the holy spirit you know is is pour, poured out and uh, peter makes his uh, sermon there there will be people who will choose to stay back in jerusalem to be part of the church okay so how the church will actually provide for their needs because they don't have anything in jerusalem their homes are far away uh, but they make a decision not to go back they make a decision to just stay back in jerusalem so that is why the whole concept of dwelling visitors are living for a prolonged period of time that's how we we'll understand yeah thank you yeah any other any other comments or any other thoughts so far Um, yeah, I just want you to elaborate on the term that says divided tongues. Like, um, we know what is tongues. Okay. What, what does it actually mean by divided tongues? Like, why it's it? All right. So when we say divided tongues, I mean, I have not read anything about it. So I'm not uh, you know, speaking from that knowledge. But my understanding is those tongues of fire separate. Because if you take a fire by itself, then you have the, the flame and, you know, the way it burns, we know. But then just sort of pieces of that of that main fire is sitting upon each of the believers so that way it is saying divided it's not like you're seeing one huge fire but it's divided and it is also said that uh, in the uh, temple that god uh, uh, like uh, the temple worship that god instituted uh, the way things used to happen is that the acceptance of a, sa a sacrifice was made by fire Whenever the sacrifice is accepted, fire would sort of consume it. So it was one way of God expressing his pleasure on all his people. So instead of showing one big fire, uh, maybe God wanted to depict, you know, that accepting fire on each person. So divided tongues. Yeah, sat upon which is I, I feel like that is what it is. If anyone else has a different take on the divided tongues. Uh, yeah, you can please pitch it. Okay, uh, Rosalind is asking uh, are the 120 disciples from Galilee? Uh, yeah, so the profile of the 120 disciples, uh, mostly they would be from Galilee, is, is what uh, we understand. Most of them. Okay, all right. Uh, at this point, uh, we could just uh, stop. We'll come back for the next session. So let's just go in for a uh, break class and we will start at uh, 10 p.m. Thank you.